Suzaku Kurudugi is, as you've just learned, and will continue to see through the remainder of this video, the most stupid character to ever exist in an anime. You would think that stating that Lelouch is the smartest character of all time is like saying Adam Sandler has a higher IQ than these 20 toddlers playing with this shit. Literally works for genocidal maniacs. Not only is this some peak hypocrisy, but it's also peak stupidity. After this scene, I can't fucking deal with this mental midget anymore. Alright, let's do this. Code Geass is a show that hardly needs any introduction. At least I hope not. We're not that far removed from the mainstream anime favorites of the late 2000s and 2010s, are we? Eh, in any case. It's one of the most popular mech anime, and THE big rival to Death Note back when both shows were airing, it's safe to say that we tend to hear a lot of opinions about it and the characters that drive it. This is where we reach a problem. See, it's kinda got an Evangelion thing going around, where a lot of the more vocal and disparaging takes about the main characters feels like a fundamental misunderstanding of the show itself. It doesn't help that on the more positive side of things, both shows are huge with the unlike other mecha anime, this one focuses on the characters crowd, which is its own can of worms. Lelouch, V. Britannia, and Tuzaku Kururugi make for one of the more iconic rivalries in mecha anime. Or anime period, for that matter and I've seen a lot of takes about each character, many of which I think greatly miss the point. I could say that about a lot of aspects of the show, really. Now, I'm not gonna act like I'm the only one who's ever made some of the talking points you'll hear throughout this video. There are good vids out there that I feel understand one or both of these characters I'll be discussing well enough. However, the sentiments I'm combating are popular enough that I still feel confident in making this. So in any case, let's jump in. Lelouch is a bit of a trickier case than Suzaku, namely because it's less that people just can't engage well with what the point of him is supposed to be, and more like there are critical aspects of him I find to be overlooked or misrepresented. With him, it's mainly regarding his intelligence. On one hand, people tend to find him so amazingly smart that his hardships make him that much more compelling. On the other hand, some people think he's only viewed as smart because the rest of the cast is inherently and often arbitrarily stupid. Naturally, if you're closer to the former camp, but from my experience, I don't tend to hear much about his actual mistakes that the anime punishes him for from either group. Amidst all the Lelouch vs. Light Yagami comparisons and all the both would barely pass as janitors and Reinhardt's forces memes, I don't tend to see a lot of people acknowledge the fact that the anime punches him a lot. Sure, in the first five episodes, his opponents were green and feeble, but then when he has to face someone with actual military leadership experience like Cornelia in episode 7, he chokes. He has to be saved by someone else. And apparently nobody I talk to cares. Hell, some view that as validation of their negative points against him, despite it being intentional in showing that Lelouch can't get cocky just because he outplayed a couple of low-level bosses. Then we get his hastiness in planning out another fight, which results in a landslide. And afterwards he goes, yeah, that last part caused a lot more damage and casualties than I expected. Maybe since I was trying to avoid that, I should have consulted my smart scientist peer Nina about something like this. She'd have known what to do. At least hypothetically anyway, because you know, I am Zero and I'm trying to hide that, you know. Remember when a cat almost exposed me? God. And then it turns out among those landslide casualties is the dad of one of his love interests, Shirley. Which directly results in everything that happens with her afterwards for the next few episodes. And the rest of the show for that matter. Lelouch is also a notably terrible leader, and the show is more than happy to hurt him for that. Sure, his plans get results, and he has the charisma and theatrics to hype everyone up. However, he doesn't trust any of his subordinates despite leading them, and even showing his face to several other collaborators, because the Black Knights are Japanese, and he thinks they'd fucking crucify him if they found out a Britannian, one of royalty at that, was leading them. And every time someone does find out the truth, it hurts like a betrayal, whether it be Colin or the rest of the Black Knights. I won't defend the actual Black Knights betrayal scene, but the point still stands. Lelouch is hasty, arrogant, and distrusting, and every single one of his fuck-ups results from those traits biting him in the ass, consistently. 
Up until the ending with the Zero Requiem, it almost didn't matter what results he got with all the bridges he ended up burning, and the unnecessary casualties he tried and failed to avoid as a result of his vices. Sure, he learned from each and every failure, but each consequence was increasingly damaging. Hell, the revival movie Fukatunu Lelouch shows that it's not like other characters forget some of the awful things he did. Cornelia sure as hell doesn't, and when Suzaku sees him alive and well, he beats the shit out of the man, believing he lied to him yet again. Yeah, Ogi is super apologetic to him over the betrayal, but neither that nor the result of the Zero Requiem negate the legitimate faults others had a right to confront him on. Besides, the Lucius plans never fully work. Even when the broad strokes of his plans come to fruition, there's usually a hitch that either stops the plan dead in its tracks, or otherwise prevents the ulterior motives of said goal from being fulfilled. As an example, sure in episode 4, Lelouch's stunt to save Suzaku utterly embarrassed the man who tried to make a show of his execution while propping up Lelouch's zero alter ego as an icon. However, he couldn't secure Suzaku's loyalty, and instead his stunt only cemented their rivalry after learning of Suzaku's ideology and why he opposes Zero. Now let's look at episodes 10 through 12. Sure, the Black Knights were winning their current battle in the campaign, and they almost nabbed Cornelia, but they never managed to deal with Suzaku any time he showed up in his Lancelot mech. So after the Lelouch was out of commission and Suzaku was running rampant, they all dipped. Part of the problem is, of course, that Lelouch is terrible at coming up with contingencies. If a plan folds, everything's going foobar. Like with the end of Season 1, the Battle of Tokyo in R2, and half of the plans that do succeed in the first two thirds of the series. I can see why those two schools of thought I mentioned earlier exist, though. When Lelouch's plans do succeed, it's presented with all the hype of a battle shonen's peak. Like the introduction of Zero slash Rescue of Suzaku, the formal introduction of the Black Knight, and both times Lelouch won against Mao. He's such a compelling, scheming bastard that even outside of how sympathetic his motivations are, it's hard not to get swept up in the grandeur of his successes, at least if you don't hate Lelouch or his show. Furthermore, the Zero Requiem is a spectacular ending where Lelouch managed to pull one over on even much of the audience who were worried about the dark path he seemed to go on in the final arc. Besides, he brought world peace. It's kind of easy for the audience to ignore his legitimate faults, even the ones the show regularly dogs on him for because of how his journey ends and how compelling he was from the start. To some, that's not worth talking about when it comes to what makes him compelling. Hell and Fukatu, after Lelouch comes back to his normal state of mind, he starts doing his Lelouch thing like we all came here for. And when that stops working and he starts to crumble, C2 slaps some sense into him because in her mind and the audience's, He's this brilliant and tenacious guy who can't and won't truly ever give up. Sure, we've seen him have his down moments, one of which in R2 was honestly ridiculous, but nobody's here for that. We're all here to watch Lelouch be Zero, this symbol, this icon of tenacious, glorious justice. And that's exactly what he needed to hear to get back on his feet during the climax. Another thing to note is that, even from the first episode, the show provides a lot of chess metaphors, and the scene where he beats someone at chess despite moving the king first so he can make a speech about kings leading is a prime example of that. The whole chess aspect of the show can be a bit dubious, and later on it becomes looser and less detailed with its uses of chess than what I described. This is where the negative side of this whole debacle comes in. Like, yeah, some of his successes are kinda dubious, and they rely on some serious ass pulls or ideas that really force you to suspend your disbelief. Whenever he pre-records himself, anticipating his opponent's every move, it may be cool in the moment, but it is kinda ridiculous. That and some of his failures are just the result of him being an absolute fucking moron. Like the infamous Effeminator incident, where despite knowing that the Gyasu was on the Fritz and that C2 told him to be careful, he still looked Euphemia dead in the eye and said, Hey, I know you managed to get me to drop all my shit because you're bridging the gap between the Britannians and the Japanese with your thing, but wouldn't it be funny if I told you to kill the Japanese? And then that causes a guillotine to occur which makes her slaughter everybody. Yeah, that's unforgivably bad. On the other hand, I wouldn't say that there are many moments past the first six episodes where Lelouch only outwits someone because they're stupid or inexperienced. Even then, as I established, most of those were intentional for when he gets bamboozled in episode 7. At most, you can say that the ways he weasels out of Colin finding out his true identity throughout most of Season 1 were a bit ridiculous. Especially in Episode 3 with the phone call incident that almost certainly should not have saved him from Colin deducing who he was with his Gios-related slip-ups. Especially given how suspicious she was at first. 
Even if not all of his victories or escapes were exactly earned, there are plenty that weren't the result of assholes or other logic strainers like the opponent holding the idiot ball. Lelouch earns a lot of what he gets, both in terms of his successes and failures, and that's a large part of why he's so compelling. Speaking of idiots, it's high time we talk about... Though before we really get on to why he works, we need to talk about what he is. It's about time we discuss the anti suit Basically, think of a character, often the main one, who is constantly in the wrong. All the time. They don't tend to accomplish a whole lot, they constantly get on even the more sympathetic characters' nerves, and ultimately, their everything is bad and they should feel bad. It's basically the opposite of a Mary suit, except for the part where they're still the center of focus. While there are plenty of characters who avoid this by getting development to straighten them out later on, even good characters that veer close to this will first and foremost be defined by their glaring faults the show will constantly challenge. Asuka from Evangelion is a stupendous example. Sure, she starts out competent, but the show makes no qualms about humiliating her or showing that every time she acts like such a petulant, competitive brat, she only brings the main squad's effectiveness down and damn near nobody wants to deal with her shit. The better our main protagonist Shinji performs, the worse Asuka's inferiority-superiority complex gets, and the more she lashes out, leading to a downward spiral, even after we learn what caused her to be the way she is. We're not expected to like her, though. We're meant to pity how self-destructive and awful she is, and understand why she is this way, and why she can't communicate any of her genuine feelings in a way where anyone else gets it. Of course, not every character that mildly resembles an anti sue is as good as her, or Thorfinn from Vinland Saga, or even Camille Bidon from Zeta Gundam, the last of whom develops out of this in a frankly heartbreaking manner. The reason they work is because their shows unambiguously show how wrong they are in a way that allows us to understand them and still find their stories compelling. Their idiocy and other flaws are examined and weaponized productively, in the hopes that the audience is angry at their stupidity for the right reasons, rather than because the narrative said they're dumb so things can happen. Unfortunately, this means that sometimes we wind up with garbage like Mika Shimotsuki from Psychopaths 2, or Shin Asuka from Gundam Seed Destiny. The true blue anti sues Sure, for Shin Asuka we get some sympathetic reasoning for his constant lashing out and revenge desires right out the bat. His family died getting caught in the crossfires of a battle in the previous installment, Gundam Seed, with Shin being the only survivor. However, the show is so meek in terms of actually confronting his treatment of others, only letting him get admonished for playing a hero the one time he tries to do something good in the first third of the show. The constant flashbacks don't help either, and the direction they take him in in the middle of the show doesn't help his character enough to really become likable or interesting, especially with how awful he could still be. And that's to say nothing of what the last third of the show does with him. Oh god, it's so pathetic I almost feel bad for him. It's funny that I bring up C, because its protagonist, Kira Yamato, is even more relevant. Not only is he kind of the opposite of Shin, but Suzaku also feels like what would happen if Kira would frame differently. Both are super special and powerful pacifist types who get a cute, pink-haired influential teenage girl to fall in love with them and help legitimize their ideologies. However, Kira is framed much more positively. Sure, he does have to kill once in a blue moon, but apparently at some point, he can just blast other combatants' mobile suits in such a way where it merely leaves their mechs incapable of combat, rather than killing anyone, which is completely another bullshit. That's also the scanning shit like his entirely unwarranted bro code violation that has the series frame him in the right and the victim in the wrong. Or the last sort of seat Destiny does that has him really rise to the Gary Stu status everyone knows him for. Hence why he's often called Jesus Yamato by the Gundam community. It's almost as if Ichiro Okuchi and Goto Taniguchi really hated Kira and really wanted to right away to give him what for, because Suzaku eats so much shit. For one, the peaceful ideas he has simply don't fly here. His superiors and other characters he interacts with constantly challenge him on his beliefs at the best of times. Until Euphemia comes along, and even for a while afterwards, we're shown that nobody respects his ideas of trying to change Britannia from within. Why would they? They conquered Japan, his nation, a decade ago and branded its citizens 11th. Literal numbers in order to strip them of any national pride or sense of identity they had left. Suzaku working for the enemy regime therein sounds utterly asinine, especially when almost nobody there respects him and, oh, they fucking frame him for the death of one of their princes until Zero busts him out and he still goes back to them. 
this absolute fucking goober, this idiotic troglodyte, is just that persistent, and yet he can never catch them in the act of, or stop them from murdering civilians until sometime in R2. And yet he still has the fucking temerity to lambast Zero, who he doesn't know his illusion until the end of Season 1, for seemingly but not actually putting people in harm's way during the rescue op for him, he's such a hypocrite, and it keeps being a persistent issue to the point where during one of their conflicts, Zero just dips and he doesn't have time to argue who's the bigger hypocrite. He knows he's one as well. But as for the whole ideological debate about the ends justifies the means versus pacifism and changing the government from within, he knows it's a joke. We are meant to know that it's a joke by this point. Suzaku has long since poisoned the well, and has continually come off as aggressively hypocritical given his actions in Zero Hate Boner. The smoking gun behind why the show really wants you to understand that Suzaku's ideals are ingenuine and inadequate comes in episode 16, when Mao, a character who can read people's minds, unveils to Lelouch why Suzaku is the way he is. Suzaku's father was the Prime Minister of Japan, and with his death came the end of the war, wherein Japan surrendered to Britannia, who would end up taking him over. What we didn't know until now was that a child Suzaku stabbed his father to death because he didn't want anyone to die in one last stand. This therein caused the end of the war as we know it, and he's been traumatized with guilt ever since. As such, his moral compass is merely a coping mechanism to drown all that out and become capable of not detesting himself. Naturally, he's wrecked when all that gets dug up, because now he's more or less reliving that trauma. Still, within this context, we understand exactly who he is and why his faulty reasonings and actions are the way they are before he digs his heels further in his rivalry. It's an extreme case of cognitive dissonance. The entire moral and ideological debate with him and Zero no longer applies now that the show has demonstrated that the more foolish of the two parties is fundamentally ill-equipped to be part of this discourse. His ideas could only be legitimized by someone with the power and genuineness of, well, Euphemia. Hell, until a certain Giyosing incident occurred, she actually succeeded where Suzaku failed, getting Lelouch to consider giving up his vengeful path by showing him exactly what results peaceful actions and changes from within the system can have. Of course, it was both in flux and just the start, but it was something. More than what Suzaku ever did, and even more than what Lelouch did, as it was a space that could actually unite the Japanese and Britannians together. There's no hypocrisy to her, only bravery and understanding. The debate of Season 1 closed out with her, and it makes Lelouch shutting down Suzaku's attempts to keep it going all the funnier and more appropriate. So, yeah, the discourse is dead, along with the only participant whose soul isn't bloodstained. Meanwhile, Suzaku may hate to admit it, but he's every bit the killer he hates Zero for being. He does try his hardest in R2, but nowhere is this better demonstrated than the Battle of Tokyo. Earlier in Season 1, Lelouch Gyasu Suzaku so he doesn't sacrifice himself to kill Zero, and the order given by Lelouch's power is for Suzaku to live. Back then, that simply meant making a beeline out of the battlefield before he got obliterated. Now, yeah, the people affected by Lelouch's Gyas aren't actively conscious in this state but it does put them in a sort of autopilot, even in cases where people are forced to go directly against their beliefs, in which case they'll struggle for a while before being fully overpowered. However, this last part never happens to Suzaku, which makes it real telling when, while equipped with a Flaya missile and being put in a life or death situation, he doesn't decide to flee or even fire a regular shot to distract whoever's in front of him. He instead fires the fucking missile into the city DECIMATING MILLIONS! Literally an episode prior, this little chicken shit stopped the ever-living piss out of Lelouch, who tried to make amends and ask for help. Sure, he had a right to be pissed at Lelouch, given that he's responsible for his girlfriend, as well as other people close to both of them, being fucking dead, and he's zero. But yeah, there's a reason this event was the ultimate wake-up call for him. This is who he is, and why he deserves all the shit that happens to him. And there's a lot that happens to this man before he finally changes his ways and gets people's messages through his thick skull. He lost his girlfriend, he found out that his best friend was his arch rival, he lost the respect and trust of some of the few people left alive who ever gave a shit about him, and he even lost his will to live. And almost all of this took place before the incident that led him to accepting who he was and joining Lelouch in his crusade against Britannia. As such, the Zero Requiem in the final five episodes as a whole, therefore make sure he has everything he could never want. He has to deny the people who want to essentially blend the living with the dead, revoking any potential chance of being with his girlfriend again. 
He has to keep living under the guise of the symbol he wants to test it, as his actual reputation is dragged through the mud by the time of his supposed death. He has to keep lying to Lelouch's sister, who at one point trusted him, and in order to do those last few things, he has to kill his best friend, Lelouch, who he made amends with. And he accepts all of this. It's the perfect ending for him. Now that he's developed past the borderline anti-Sue the show revealed him to be for over 40 episodes, it's fucking brilliant. There's a reason why this was the point where some people started liking Suzaku after viewing him as a nuisance for so long. It's a sobering yet satisfying payoff and an arc chalk full of them. And you know, this is kind of wild, because almost everyone loves the Zero Requiem. It made R2 for some people. And it's widely considered one of the greatest endings in anime for how it wrapped up Lelouch's story in a grandiose, satisfying, and bittersweet manner. And yet I barely see anyone talk about how it does the same for Suzaku. And with a better understanding of these characters and how the show portrays their faults, I think it makes the ending hit that much harder and makes it all the more apparent what a perfect conclusion it was for them. Even with the Fukatsu movie and the alternate recap film continuity existing, we can debate the quality of how they're written, as I've done throughout much of this video, but doing so becomes much more productive once you understand what the writers were going for with them in the first place. I know this show has received a bit of harsh critical re-evaluation in some spaces after the rocky ride of R2 blossomed into an outstandingly positive consensus, but hey, here's hoping I can shake that up a little with what I presented, though that might just be my sense of self-importance talking.